Okay, um, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Sarah Alexander, and I'm the policy engagement chair for CASP um, this year. And if you uh, are new to CASP um, or haven't heard of us before, um, we're a graduate and postdoc uh, led group at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, focused on science policy, so educating um, different groups on science policy issues, engaging graduate students in building skills um, to go on to engage in science policy in the future, um, and advocating for evidence-based policy. And this morning, we're really lucky to have um, ben Van Pelt um, from the UW State Government Relations Office uh, to give us an overview of the Wisconsin Legislature um, and so and how it works in sort of Wisconsin Legislature 101. Um, so Ben is the Assistant Director for State Relations um, currently at UW-Madison and previously he uh, was the Legislative Liaison for the Wisconsin DNR um, and also lobbied for the American Heart Association and held various positions um, in the state capitol and is also a proud grad of UW-Madison um, for undergrad. So he has a lot of experience to share and with that, Ben, I'll turn it over to you and looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks so much, Sarah, really appreciate it. And uh, before you say how lucky you are, let me finish my presentation and then you can judge me based on that. I might, I might bore everyone into leaving before this is all over. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen, the, the first step in this whole thing. And uh, hopefully I do this correctly. All right, does that look good on your end, Sarah? Yep, that looks great. Perfect. Um, and I, I really appreciate the the wonderful introduction. Um, and just want to start by by thanking the the folks from Cast, Sarah, uh, Chris, other Chris, as we love to to call you. Um, it's been great working with you folks for the past couple of months, and uh, you're doing a, a wonderful job. And I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to be a resource for you all as uh, as you continue on with this uh, project of uh, engaging with uh, with state government and specifically legislature. So. Um, I'll just start with a, a real brief intro, as Sarah mentioned, um, this is going to be kind of a, a state government 101 presentation. Um, this stuff is going to kind of scratch the surface of um, everything going on uh, in, in state government, that big white building uh, down State Street from, uh, from the UW-Madison campus. It's a wonderful place, um, depending on the day and depending on who I'm working with down there. But um, I'm going to kind of go over a, a bunch of a uh, bunch of different stuff today with a with a real focus on the state legislature um, and, and speaking with with Sarah and, and the crew. Um, I think that's where uh, where this presentation is going to be uh, the most useful um, and uh, and we'll get into to some of that. So um, just some ground rules too. Um, I plan on uh, going through my slideshow hopefully in a, in a pretty uh, expeditious manner um, with, uh, with some time for questions at the end. But, but Sarah, please, I'll ask you to jump in if there's anything I say, any vernacular that I might use um, that, uh, that's, that's really confusing or just needs some clarification, please just jump in and stop me. You know, I'm, I'm pretty easygoing. Um, and uh, so I don't mind being, a, being cut off if I say something that just seems completely crazy, which is not outside the norm, believe me. Um, Sarah already touched on my on my uh, biography, but I, I, I just wanted to um, to say um, I'm happy to be the assistant director of state relations here for, for UW Madison. I do have a, a little bit of experience in state governments, um, so I, I at least it seems like I, I at least know what I'm talking about a little bit. So, um, so I will go ahead and jump into who kind of we are here at uh, at UW Madison. Um, if I can advance my slides, um, there we go. Um, so the Office of State Relations, which is where I sit, um, falls under uh, the university relations. Um, and we're a division within the UW um, that kind of focuses on uh, outward engagement amongst stakeholders, um, uh, different, uh, different members of, of the public, um, and, uh, and really focuses on, on kind of engaging the university in, in kind of some of those outward facing tasks. So uh, again, specifically, I can talk about state relations and I'll get a little bit more into that in, in a couple slides. Um, but we work, um, uh, our office is based out of uh, Bascom Hall and we work incredibly close with the chancellor along with uh, obviously university communications falls within UR, uh, marketing falls within UR, corporate relations, you know, all, the, all these different 
um, all these different entities that really focus on on some outward engagement uh, aspects of the university's role in uh, in the state. So, um, next. Up is just a brief uh, snapshot of our government relations team. Again, we're going to be talking about government today, so um, it's important to know the, the players. Um, our vice chancellor for university relations is Charlie Hazlitt, um, and then we've got a list of, of a bunch of other people. Just important to note that, again, the university engages um, in government on the local level, the state level, and the federal level. You can see at the very bottom of the list, um, almost purposely, um, just as a uh, to tease my colleague Mike a little bit, um, our, our federal relations folks are both based out of Washington, D.C. They live out there and, and work out there full time. So, um, and they're engaging with, with folks on the Hill, um, which is it got to be almost as fun as the job that Crystal and I have. So, um, Next up, kind of the, the what we do, and I'll just briefly go into, into some of these items. Um, so what is government relations? How, what is it in, in terms of, in terms of um, what it means to UW-Madison? Um, and so what Crystal and I are really focused on on the state level, uh, kind of two things, two core functions make up a lot of, a lot of our, our, our roles here at, at the university. Um, advocacy, um, which, which kind of is broken down into the things you see on the screen. So, so lobbying, uh, direct lobbying on, on different budget priorities, on different legislative priorities. Um, and sometimes it's on the offense, sometimes it's on the defense. And, and I'll just say, you know, on the offense, you know, we're, we're currently uh, actively lobbying for uh, a good, hopefully good, fingers crossed, um, state budget in this coming biennium. Um, we're hoping for uh, a couple building projects. We're hoping for uh, a couple things in the, the Board of Regents budgets um, that, that we can bring home you know, make the university a, a better place. Um, and then on the defensive side of things, sometimes there are uh, issues that come up through the legislative session that uh, maybe would impact uh, the university in a, in a negative way. And so we, we go up and we try to explain that. We um, try to lobby against some things from time to time. Um, hopefully um, in a given session, we're doing a lot more on the uh, proactive or offensive side of things than the defensive side of things, but you never do know. So. Um, we also do a lot of responding to legislator inquiries on, on any given day, um, you know, we can get questions about, uh, you know, with admissions, uh, admissions based criteria, or we can get questions about active research in uh, the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, you know, I mean, the, they really span the, the, the spectrum in terms of um, the topics that, that we get asked. Um, and, and that's where we kind of facilitate uh, the experts on campus. Um, with the legislators and, uh, and and make sure that the questions are getting answered. So we serve kind of a liaison role between um, some of the some of the folks in state government and, and folks here on campus, um, really really acting to 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 serve both both sides. So the the internal, the campus side, and the external, the the legislative side. Um, and we also work a lot on coalition building, um, both up at the state capitol with individual legislators and committees and staff, um, as well as stakeholders and uh, folks folks on campus. Um, and then the outreach portion of our, of our jobs really focuses on, again, building those relationships, which I, I already have mentioned, and I'm going to mention time and time again. I mean, that's a, a big part of our jobs is to, is to build those relationships with elected officials and, and stakeholders and campus partners. It runs the whole gamut. Um, we're, we're engaging with folks on a day-to-day -day basis uh, more often than not. Um, we also, our office also oversees our right, uh, some of our right, outreach programming, um, and this manifests itself in a, in a couple different formats. But um, Badger Talks, you may you may be familiar with, is a is a function of of the Office of State Relations. Um, it's uh, it's it's kind of a group of different experts on campus that go around and present um, to different local organizations or local entities um, on a variety of different topics. It's a really good way to get some of our experts uh, from UW-Madison out into communities across the state or during a pandemic, um, not out into those communities, but via Zoom into those communities. Um, and then uh, last but not least, you know, we, we certainly um, keep campus stakeholders informed of, of things happening at the, at the state level, state government level, um, and, and update, you know, the chancellor and, and uh, the vice chancellor pretty regularly on, on things that are occurring, so. So state government, um, what what is it? Um, you know, how do uh, we interact with it? Um, I, I will mention um, that UW system, so the umbrella over UW Madison, um, is is kind of a state entity, and uh, we are we are directly connected to the state. Um, the state is responsible for about a billion dollars um, in in 
uh, a given year to the UW system as a whole. And uh, UW Madison, it's about 450 million, but we don't need to crunch the the numbers all that much. Um, so, so the state is actually a pretty significant stakeholder in the UW system and UW Madison, and vice versa. Um, we are uh, the the state's largest employer. UW system is, and if you were to take UW Madison out of UW system, UW Madison would be the state's largest employer. Um, so it's a you know it's a we we work hand in hand with with state governments and um, you know are, are more or less an entity um, in, in certain terms. So. But the other the other um, different buckets of state government include the the governor and and the administration. So these are the the different state agencies. As Sarah mentioned uh, before coming to UW Madison, I was serving a legislative liaison over at the, the Department of Natural Resources. So that's one of the the larger um, state level departments. Um, then you have the judicial side of things um, with the Supreme Court and and the seven justices. Um, and then you have uh, the legislature, and that's what we're going to be focusing our attention on today um, is, is the legislature, the 132 wonderful members um, in both the um, state Senate and the state assembly, and we're going to a little bit more um, a little bit more into uh, what that looks like and, and kind of the structure, who they are. Um, and, and for today's purposes, um, we're going to be really focusing in on um, kind of policy development, um, how a bill becomes a law is going to be a, a large portion of this. I'm not trying to do a schoolhouse rock video or anything. I'm not trying to be redundant and, and, and things uh, folks already know, but we're going to kind of dive into the details on every step of that process and, and really look at, um, you know, how legislators think about policy, how they interact with stakeholders, how they interact with the general public, and, and really how, how bills and ideas get made into laws up at the state capitol. Um, so that's really going to be our, our emphasis today, but we'll continue moving forward. So again, the structure of the of the state legislature, it's it's broken up into into two bodies, um, the state assembly um, and the state Senate. Um, when I was a, a staff member in the state Senate, um, one of my best friends worked uh, in the state assembly and we used to tease him all the time about, uh, you know, coming over to what we dubbed as the upper house because um, there are fewer members of, of the state Senate. Um, each senator, as you'll see in, in coming slides, kind of gets more staff, they get more, they have a little bit more autonomy. Um, and, and he said, well, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to go to the upper house. I'm in the people's house because we are much closer to the actual people that we represent. And you can see that broken down by the numbers. So there are 99 assembly members. You know, you extrapolate that out based on the um, population of Wisconsin. And um, each district right now is, is drawn based on 2010 uh, census to represent about 54,000 people. Whereas a state Senate seat, there are 33 of those. So about a third uh, uh, member, a third of those members, so three times the size, they're, they're uh, drawn to represent about 162,000 people. Um, the other one of the other key differences between the two houses is that uh, state representatives in the in the assembly are elected every two years. So every single election cycle, these folks are up They're They're running campaigns. They're out there knocking on doors. They're out there raising money. Um, they're out there talking to voters and, and trying to get, you know, put back into office, um, whereas the state Senate, they're elected to four year terms. Um, and these are staggered. So of the of the 33 seats. Um, roughly half, obviously 33 is an odd number, but roughly half are going to be up, um, you know, this past cycle in 2020, and, and then the other half will be up in, um, in 2022. And, and we'll, I'll show you a little map representation of that as well. Um, but I will note um, that the, the, the district numbers here, the 54 and, and 162, these are, these are going to change. Um, we're obviously um, just, just underwent a, a census. Um, and with, with a census um, comes redistricting. And so this coming session, um, the state legislature and the governor's uh, office and administration will be taking up uh, the, the big task of redistricting, reapportionment, um, you know, kind of uh, taking the, the change in Wisconsin's population and uh, putting that into, into the 99 assembly districts and, and 33 Senate districts, and then uh, obviously the congressional districts on the federal level as well. I believe the, the last that I read, um, Wisconsin is poised to uh, grow just a little bit. Um, 
but not enough to, to gain any uh, congressional seats. That, that's, that's really where the, the only change would occur. Um, the, the state assembly and state senate, I think, have been 99 and 33 respectively for decades, years and years and years. That's, that's not likely to change anytime soon. It's just the, the number of folks that they represent will likely shift up a little bit. You'll probably see the, the state assembly numbers climb to close to 60, if not 60, and, and state senate, obviously, you know, close to 180, right around there. So, um, but that's going to be a, a big task for the, the state legislature this coming session and certainly something to keep an eye on as, as we're talking about in, engaging. Um, so next, we will just um, show you a quick representation. Um, please note the date at the top here. I, I ripped this directly from a Wisconsin Blue Book, which I'll talk a little bit more about later uh, from the 2013-14 session. Actually, one of the one of the folks in this picture isn't even in the state legislature anymore. Uh, Representative Weininger retired, um, uh, didn't run again to uh, to take another another position. Um, but this is. Um, just a real quick breakdown of, of kind of how Senate districts and assembly districts interact. So you have Senator Coles, um, who represents the second uh, second Senate district. It's up near the Green Bay area in north, uh, northeast Wisconsin. He kind of represents the western portion of Green Bay and then, and then into the surrounding areas. And you can see that the second Senate district is made up of the fourth, fifth, and sixth assembly district. So again, just uh, reinforcing the point that that every senator has technically three representatives, three assembly members in their given Senate district. Um, th these relationships are, are pretty darn important too. It's it's worth noting that that typically when you know a, a legislator is dealing with an issue, they're they're going to probably team up um, if the personalities. They're going to probably team up. Um, to, to work on, on individual issues impacting their area. And as we talk about policy development, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention time and time again that, that a lot of policy coming from the state capitol actually comes from individual constituents, um, your, your, your individual districts. You're going to get ideas from, you know, uh, the, the average citizens um, in, in your district who reach out with, with a problem or an issue or, or maybe even a new idea. Um, and, and that's where policy kind of uh, is generated a lot of times. And so when you're talking about policy development, this relationship between senators and representatives is, um, it can, be, can be really important and, and you know, they can act as, as a team sometimes. They can sometimes act not so much as a team, but uh, most of the time we're gonna, you know, we're gonna see folks really get along within their districts and, and, and work together on a lot of things facing, facing their individual communities. Um, so again, I, I mentioned this before, but these are the election results from this past November. Um, as you can see, this this map was um, was done up at uh, at about noon uh, the, the the following day after the election. So some of these are are shaded a little bit differently. Um, there were a couple seats that were really within kind of the margin of error and and could have been uh, could have been subject to a uh, to a recount. Um, those did not end up happening. So any any district that you see here that's blue is held by a Democrat um, in this uh, for the coming legislative session. Any district shaded in red is going to be held by a Republican in this coming legislative session. But as you can see, this is the kind of the breakdown of the assembly versus the Senate. Uh, assembly districts much smaller, um, you know, broken up across the state. Senate districts much larger. Um, and, um, and then you can also see the staggered results here. So there were 16 senators um, up this past cycle in 2020. That means there'll be seven. 17 um, come 2022 and so all those gray boxes on there will then be um, will then be uh, run in for the uh, for the 2022 cycle um, and really there there were you know this this past election cycle was it was a pretty big one I'm, I'm sure none of you saw any commercials or, or heard anything about it um, but uh, but for us um, for the uh, for the political insiders if you will I hate using that term um, you know we were inundated with stuff left and right um, um, you know, talked a, a lot about the election cycle. I know I, I, I don't think I slept for about three straight days the week of uh, the week of the uh, third. So um, it was a, it was a heck of fun, um, and I have a very liberal definition of the word fun. Um, but really, in the state legislature, there wasn't a ton that changed. Um, and and I'll just mention uh, briefly. Um, uh, Wisconsin Assembly actually saw two districts uh, flip, um, so two districts that became um, Democratic that uh, that were previously held by Republicans. Those two, um, you can't really see them because they're so tiny down there. They're, they're suburban Milwaukee districts. They're in the kind of that that breakout box. Um, um, so two districts around the uh, the the city of Milwaukee actually flipped into 
uh, Democratic control that were previously held by incumbent Republicans. Um, and then there was the Senate's a little a little fickle, but there were there were technically two um, uh, districts that were held by Democrats that that flipped to Republican control. And um, I'll just point those out quickly. The one in the very northwest corner, um, so the Hudson um, area, um, was a was a seat that was won in a special election by a Democrat um, after um, after the previous senator had retired um, to take a take a different position. Um, that flipped back to being a Republican district. It had for a very very long time, um, and then the Green. Bay area, so the the district um, that represents the city of Green Bay, and then up into the Marinette area in the in the northeast corner of that map was another one that was held by a Democrat for a very 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 long time. Um, that uh, that senator retired, um, and then um, in in the re-election, it was won by a Republican. So, um, so just a couple minor um, changes, kind of overall map and and overall makeup of the of the Wisconsin state legislature. Um, next, uh, you know, in in preparing for this, you know, Sarah and I, um, she did a great job of sending sending over topics that uh, that she thought would be helpful for the conversation. And, and one of those is just kind of structure and how offices are structured and, and staffing in the in the um, state assembly and state senate. So what I did is I just kind of pulled, um, screenshots of um, individual senators and representatives from uh, districts, <laughs> excuse me, districts across the state. Um, and uh, and their staff list. So this represents these four um, individuals represent just the the typical member in the in the state senate or the state assembly. I'll touch on that a little bit later. But for instance, Senator Coles um, is a Republican from Green Bay. He has four staff um, in his office in the state senate. Representative Allen is a Republican representative from Waukesha. He has two staff in his assembly office. So obviously, bigger staffs in the state senate, more people that they represent. Uh, the, some would say a larger, uh, larger responsibilities. I, I wouldn't say that, but some would. Um, and then if you go over to the to the Democratic side, the minority members, um, Senator Larson, who represents Milwaukee, he has three staff in his office, and Representative Anderson, who um, is right here in Dane County, represents Fitchburg and Monona and some of the surrounding areas. Um, th this is technically one and a half staff. It looks obviously like two because you can't split a person in half, but you can kind of distinguish it based on the email. The uh, Alyssa's email down there has a number two after it that usually indicates that they have two email addresses, one for one office that they're working in, one for another. Um, just a little insider bit of information in there. Um, but really what it breaks down to is uh, majority members in a standard office have four staff in the, in the Senate, two staff in the Assembly, minority members, three staff in the Senate, um, two or one and a half staff, excuse me, in the uh, in the assembly. Now there are some key differences here. This does not touch on leadership officials. So the speaker of the assembly, for instance, Robin Voss, um, he has like I don't know, like I haven't looked at it recently, but at one point I feel like he had like twelve staff in his office. You know, leadership are gonna they're gonna have more staff members. Um, in their uh, assigned to their offices than than just a standard member would. The other difference is uh, freshmen, so incoming uh, legislators who are elected to a first term only get one staff, um, regardless of, of whether they're in the uh, majority or minority. Um, and then um, one of the other key differences is like joint joint finance, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, they they usually get a, a little bit more staff than the than the average member because of the responsibility there and 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 really writing the the state budget. Um, the other thing that I'll note, um, you know, Sarah had asked me to, to touch on key differences between the uh, between the Senate and Assembly and, and senators and representatives and their responsibilities. And, and honestly, um, you know, the, the Senate has a, a little bit more of a responsibility when it comes to um, when it comes to voting on uh, cabinet secretaries. So the secretary of the DNR, for instance, my former boss, Preston Cole, um, the Senate was was the, the key body in, in confirming his appointment. Um, he went through a hearing process and a, a committee vote process in the Senate that he didn't have to in the assembly um, and then was voted on by the full Senate for confirmation that never went to the assembly. Um, but but other than that, really, other than the, the confirmation, the, the the oversight of the of the cabinet secretary confirmation process, there isn't a whole lot of kind of standard deviation in terms of responsibilities. I mean, really, it's just senators have a bit more autonomy because there are fewer of them and they represent more people. Um, and, and obviously, uh, the on the assembly side, there's there's more of those folks. So so you can, you know, sometimes you can focus in more on a specialty, for instance, or, or um, you know, have a have a larger role in your community because you represent kind of a smaller area and, and maybe just one city as opposed to three or four, you know. Um, but but really for um, 
for standard all practical purposes there are probably some arcane differences like some you know uh, oversight boards or commissions that that one of the houses has a, has membership in that the other one doesn't um that that really aren't utilized all that much anymore there are probably some of those around but but really for for um all standard practices the the the, the key difference there is the uh, confirmation process of of cabinet officials um, so Sarah also asked me to touch on uh, legislative calendar. Um, so this is obviously the 2019-20 session. I'll just note that that these look pretty similar from session to session, given the you know the the, the different dates. Um, the one key difference here is um, you know inauguration uh, was January 7th um, in 2019. I believe it's January 4th. I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I'm pretty sure it's January 4th this coming year. So all those new members that we just talked about, um, they won't they won't actually get seated and. And, and technically have staff or an email account or things like that or an office um, until the 4th of January. But then um, the, 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 the key structure kind of runs through uh, very similarly from session to session. So it really goes, uh, you start off with an initial floor period. Um, usually things come out really um, quickly um, uh, and and a lot of work gets done in the in the first couple of months because these are things that legislators have been focused on in the in the off season you know in the election in the election season some some officials as we talked about aren't up they're not up for re-election if you're a, a senator depending on the year or some representatives aren't challenged they don't have an opponent or maybe they're in a really safe district so there are folks that really um, there are folks that really hone in on, on pet projects or things that they really care about in, in the election season to get ready for the next session. So there are already bills that are drafted right now. There are bills waiting to be introduced on that first day of the legislative session. There are policies you know, that have been fully developed and fully vetted that are, that are ready to be thrown out there and, and start that wonderful process of how a bill becomes a law. Um, and so really things will start out pretty quickly. Um, then you kind of jump into, you kind of pump the brakes and jump into budget season um, initially in, in those odd uh, those odd numbered years. So, so this coming 2021, um, really once the, the, the governor gives his budget address, um, which, which will likely be you know, early February, mid-February, um, the legislature really grabs onto the budget and starts its work on that and really focuses on that. Um, through kind of um, usually technically in statute, it's July 1st is the end of the fiscal year. And that's when a new budget is supposed to be passed. Um, sometimes it's a little bit before, sometimes it's right on time, sometimes it's a ways after. Um, but really it's uh, budget focused from about, you know, March or April through uh, July or August. Then typically there's a recess, um, usually the month of August. Um, it, there's not much work being done in the state capitol. And then they come back in um, in September. You can see that kind of reflected down there in the, the floor period from 2019, starting in mid-September through late September, and then more subsequent floor periods in, in October and November. And then again, another recess for the holidays, mid-November through the through kind of the, the first of the year, uh, the following year. And then and then really the end of session is, is kind of an elongated floor period from January anywhere through, you know, maybe March or April, depending on when folks want to um, adjourn and, and get out back on the campaign trail and, and, and focus more on, on that side of things. So, um, but again, this is, this is kind of a standard calendar and it kind of follows that same format of, of, of session and, and bill making to budget to session, to recess, to session. Um, so um, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in any given year, but it, it kind of follows a standard format. Um, hey, ben. Yeah, Chris. What, uh, what's the difference between, can you go back to the last slide? Sure. What's the difference between the general business and limited business floor periods? So the limited business floor periods are typically veto floor periods. If you notice, those will come after um, bills being sent to the governor. And so if it, it kind of leaves an open window of if, a, if the governor will veto something, uh, the legislature can come back in and, and attempt to override that veto, sometimes being successful, sometimes not. Um, right now, the Republicans do not have a veto proof majority in either the Senate or the or the Assembly. So it's very unlikely that a veto would ever get overridden. Um, but it leaves that opportunity for that. And sometimes there's I, you know, I, I don't want to leave out the possibility that sometimes there can be um, special sessions or extraordinary sessions called by um, either the legislature or the governor's office, um, and that those can kind of fall outside of this standard calendar. For instance, um, you know, there's been talk about an extraordinary session being called this month um, to deal with some of the, the pandemic relief um, going on in the state 
they can certainly do that um, um, if, if they want to. I know the governor has called a couple different special sessions too in times that are outside of this standard calendar that's 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 created and passed at the beginning of the session. Is that did I get at that, Chris? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I I I, I didn't I, I don't want to spend too too much time on this. I know I'm I'm kind of uh, being long winded already, but the budget process um, is, is an important one to touch on because uh, in, in, for all intents and purposes, it's it's really kind of the single uh, largest bill that's passed and 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 probably most focused on um, bill passed in any given um, biennium. Um, and and so this is just a brief graph of, of kind of the budget process right now we're in the, we're in the, the governor and the agencies kind of reviewing and submitting their requests and the, and the governor um, putting together his executive budget he'll introduce that like I said in February of odd numbered years um, and and after that he'll introduce the capital budget that's that's kind of the buildings um, and, and bonding uh, type work that happens in the state um, and then the legislature will really dig into that, review it. Um, they usually host session, uh, listening sessions throughout the state. Um, they vote on individual um, items in, in the budget, make changes, um, maybe even create their own budget, who knows? Um, uh, and then, and then they'll, they'll work it through the process of the Joint Finance Committee, which is, which is the Budget Writing Committee. It's, it's made up of both uh, Assembly members and Senate members, um, and is often thought of as the, as the most powerful committee um, in the state, because uh, they really, you know, they're, they're really the Budget Writing Committee. Um, and then, and then, you know, come July, August, that's when, that's when they'll ultimately pass it. It's got to pass through both houses after the Joint Finance does their work on it. Um, and then it goes to the governor. Um, and the governor actually, just to note, um, has one of the more powerful veto pens here in Wisconsin. Uh, when it comes to the budget, he's got a, a line item veto, um, which is a, a little bit more powerful than a standard veto. Um, the other note that I'll make is uh, Wisconsin operates on a biennial budget, not an annual budget. So they will pass a budget and it will be in effect for two years. So you'll actually see line items in a budget like, uh, you know, uh, for the DNR, for instance, uh, we had a groundwater monitoring program and it was funded in, you know, it would have been funded in 2019 for a certain amount and then 2020, maybe it was the same amount, maybe it was a little bit higher, maybe it was a little bit lower. Maybe it was zeroed out, um, and so they'll actually pass a budget that will be in effect for two straight years, as opposed to coming back in and doing this on an annual basis. We are just one of, I, th I think it's 19 states that still operates on a on a biennial budget. A lot of states have shifted to an annual budget process. I know my home state of Illinois, and I hope no one judges me for that. Um, they they are on an annual budget, so they come in every single session and and kind of run through run through their budget process. Um, again, not to be redundant, but this is um, sometimes we call this the, 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 this graphic, the, the circle of doom, um, the budget process is just that, that important and that, uh, that time consuming for, for folks um, who do the work that we kind of do. Um, and, and so this just breaks it down into a little bit more, a, a little bit more detail in terms of, uh, in terms of the steps along the way. But we are going to get into um, kind of the, the the focus of our presentation, which is uh, policy development and, and how a bill becomes a law. We have a, a plethora of different graphics that, that kind of illustrate this. Uh, I think we even have like a schoolhouse rock version that's got the little bill on Capitol Hill thing. Um, but I, I felt like the, the more complicated version um, was probably the one that, that was best for, for you folks today. Um, for this audience, um, because uh, number one, um, you know, it kind of shows each individual step in, in a little bit more detail, but then it also, towards the bottom of that graph, it shows the, the, div the divergence between the assembly and the Senate. So each house um, acts, um, you know, separately on, on respective bills. Um, and sometimes that can be at the exact same time. Sometimes the assembly will, will run through a bill first, and then it will go to the Senate for the same process or vice versa. Um, the other thing that I'll just note in, in terms of um, uh, Senate and Assembly interactions on policy, it can be a little <laughs> can be a little uh, complicated or, or even redundant. Um, but but typically every bill that is introduced in in a given session will have two bills uh, attached to it. It will have an assembly bill, an AB, um, and it will have a Senate bill, an SB. And, and these are our companion bills is what they're called up at the state capitol. And they're, they're literally the same policy. They're just um, to, to move through this process potentially quicker, the, the authors um, and co-sponsors of the bill will introduce two versions, and then they'll run through their corresponding houses. I mean, the intent is that they run through them simultaneously. That's not always the case. Um, so any, any bill, or I 
I should say most bills, because it's, it's like 99% of bills up there, they will have a companion bill. And, and uh, those are those are pretty easy to find. They're usually linked to one another in, in the actual bill documents. And, um, you know, it's pretty easy to tell when there's a companion, but it but it allows for that. And it's just something to something to note. Um, so we're going to run through each of these steps in, a, in just a, a little bit more detail. And I'll try not to I'll try not to be too long winded on this. But I think this is the portion that, that really I wanted to focus on on for you folks. So, uh, you know, the drafting and, and introduction portion, this is kind of the policy development portion. Um, this is legislator gets an idea. Um, and as I said before, it's written right in the slide. Maybe it's prompted by a constituent. Maybe it's prompted by an interest group. Maybe it's prompted by an idea that they saw, you know, I don't know, on TV, or uh, I don't want to say that because that, that sounds really terrible. You know, well, yeah, we're just getting our ideas from from random uh, infomercials that we're seeing on, uh, on on Saturday mornings when we're, you know, sitting on our couch. But um, no, I, I mean, the bill ideas come from from all over the that they come from average uh, average citizens constituents who who maybe have uh, are having a problem filling a um, uh, you know filling an unemployment claim and and they think hey why don't why don't we do it this way or why don't we do it that way and the legislator's like yeah that's a good idea maybe we should do it that way um, or uh, or again from from interest groups like. Uh, you know uh, the Wisconsin Hospitals Association, for instance, representing all the all the hospitals and healthcare providers across the state. They might they might have like a real technical um, item that maybe just needs some updating in in the in state statute that that wasn't thought about 20 years ago when some bill was written. Um, that now you know you need access to electronic medical records or something, and that might need a technical change. So they'll they'll go in and talk to a legislator about introducing that bill. And um, there, there's, again, a ton of different ways that that a legislator might get an idea for a bill. Maybe maybe they're just interested in a specific policy, um, have a really, uh, really um, narrow focus area that, the, that they want to be invested in and that they want to, you know, research, uh, research policy and, and develop it. So so it, it all starts with that. It all starts with legislators or, or even staff for that for that matter. I, I shouldn't leave out staff. I used to be one of them, and I'm I'm a little biased. But um, you know, staff up, up in that building have have wonderful ideas all the time and um, have a have a core role in, in drafting legislation. But what they what they will do in turn is um, have one of the legislative service agencies. Um, it's it's typically the legislative reference bureau um, draft up um, bill language um, that will then be reviewed. Um, this can be done in a variety of different ways. Um, but but for the sake of time, we'll just run through it quickly. You know, they'll have the LRB draft up a bill. They will then uh, usually find a co-author, one other member or maybe it's multiple other members, um, usually you try to focus on the opposite house. So if you're a representative, you'll try to find a senator that will put this bill out with you. And what they will do is they will actually send it out for co-sponsorship electronically. Um, so they will send out an email with the bill draft attached um, and then usually run through um, a kind of a, a co-sponsorship memo, which basically lays out what the bill is trying to do, what the intention is, what maybe where this idea came from. Um, and then it usually has a synopsis from the Legislative Reference Bureau that's a, that's a brief analysis on the bill. And they will put that out there for any amount of time. Usually the standard time is about two weeks uh, and a call to all other legislators who might be interested in, in what they call co-sponsoring this. So your, your name will actually appear on the bill. Um, you'll, you'll be part of the, the body that's trying to pass this bill. It's, it's the most, um, outside of being a co-author, it's the, the best way to show support for something. They'll put this out and, and um, get co-sponsors. Um, usually the, trying to get the more, the, the better, um, the more support you can show for a bill initially, the better chance it has to, to, to go through the process. Um, and then once they, they get those co-sponsors, they'll, they'll actually introduce the bill, which is formally file it with the um, with the respective chamber, and then it will get assigned a bill number. It will become a uh, more public document. Um, all this stuff will be captured, and I'll get to that that resource a little bit later. Um, from there, um, it t typically goes uh, is assigned to a committee. These committees vary in in size and structure. Um, and um, and topic range for that matter. There's a lot more members in the assembly. So typically you'll have just like a, a assembly committee on agriculture, for instance, whereas the Senate, there are fewer of them, more responsibilities kind of go around. Um, they have the Senate committee on agriculture, small business and financial institutions or something. You know, it's a conglomerate committee with, with a bunch of different topics. Um, and so committees will 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 typically be um, made up of the members in, in that legislative body. 
um, that have a little bit more of an expertise or, or uh, an interest in, in, in the topics discussed. Um, and the committee will hold a public hearing we'll, where the members of the general public can come and testify. They'll hear from, from experts. Usually this is where state agencies, um, at least when I was at the DNR, we always, if there was ever a bill that related to natural resources, we always, we always were there at the committee, whether it was to testify or just to answer questions. Um, we, we wanted to be there so that so that you know folks who were interacting with this area and, and the experts in, in the state on, the, on these topics were there to, to answer questions and testify on individual bills. Um, and so it will work through the committee process. The committee will actually take a vote. Um, that vote is more of a, honestly, more of a formality than anything else. Although um, if a vote fails, if a bill fails in committee, it's typically not up on the floor of, a, of, of either chamber. Um, um, and then from there, uh, like I said, it, it comes to the, the floor of the of the respective chambers. That's a wonderful shot, the uh, state assembly um, floor. Um, it's a really beautiful building, um, and that's a really beautiful room in that in that in that great building. Um, so the bills will be technically read again, which is called a second reading. Um, legislators will introduce and vote on individual amendments. They may offer, you know, like I said, they may offer more, um, and then the bill is read for a third time. This is what they call third reading. Um, and then um, the bill is actually voted on its, in its entirety. So if there are any amendments adopted in that second reading phase, um, that will be part of the, the final bill in the third reading, which will then be voted on by the entire, the entire uh, assembly or the entire Senate, um, depending on which body it's in. Um, like I said before, um, it needs to pass through both houses, so both the Senate and the assembly. So if it's passed in one, it will be uh, messaged over to the other, and then the other body can actually take up that that version of the bill either directly off the docket and put it on the, the floor, or they can make its way through that committee process all over again in, in the excuse me in the other house and uh, and get voted on and and uh, and come to the floor over there. Um, once it is passed by both houses, it will go to the uh, to the governor for signature. I was able to find a wonderful shot of the governor wearing a, a Motion W, a Wisconsin uh, uh, sweater there while he's signing a, signing a bill on the law. Um, uh, so we'll go to, uh, to, to the governor who again can either sign or veto it. I mentioned before, if it's an appropriations bill, he's got kind of a line item there. He can pour, uh, veto portions of it. Um, and then Chris, uh, to your uh, question before, um, the legislature, um, if he does veto a bill, they can they can override it with a two thirds majority in both houses. Um, again, that's very unlikely to, to happen, especially given the makeup uh, right now. And then uh, a few days after uh, a bill is officially signed into law, and, and the the right photo here, I should just note, typically the, this is a, a pretty public thing. I mean, it's something that the governor has a lot of power in doing, and it's a it's a pretty awesome event. And so typically he'll have public bill signings. Either he'll invite stakeholders and and the individual legislators who authored a bill to either his office for the signing, or sometimes they go out on the road and do individual events across the state if it's got a real specific impact in one part of the state or an idea came from one part of the state or something like that. But a few days after that signing, that formal signing process, it will actually go into effect and become an act um, and then be um, transcribed in the state, state statute and, and is, is law. Um, so that, that's kind of the how a bill becomes a law. I just want to recap this real quick because it is uh, it, it's fairly complicated, um, but it's also it's also very important. Um, so this bill, um, SB 563, um, is one that if I go back here, we're actually, so I'm in this photo with uh, Dean Carl Martin from uh, the Division of Extension and Doug Reineman, who's an Associate Dean over at uh, the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. This is the bill we're actually testifying on in this photo. So I thought it worked as a perfect example. Um, it's a bill that uh, was relating to funding uh, for, for certain extension staff. It was making an appropriation to the university. Um, and so this is just literally a screenshot from the state legislative website, which is one of the best resources that you can find on all this stuff. And I'll, I'll touch on it briefly later, but it walks through each individual step. So if you look down, um, there, was, uh, there was a committee action, um, public hearing held on February 6th. That's the date of that photo. Um, that's, when, um, that's when we went up there and testified. And, and you can see each individual action represented. You know, They took a vote on it about a week later on the 14th. Um, it was available for scheduling. It had to go to joint finance because it, it is an appropriations bill. It passed unanimously, 14-0 there. Um, and then you can also find all your uh, co-authors and co-sponsors on these pages. So just kind of walks through your step and, and gives you, you know, dates and links and, and things like that. 
Um, so real quickly, um, I, again, Sarah, I apologize. I know I'm already already going over, but uh, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about engaging with state lawmakers. I'll just note before I, I run through this section quickly, this is really focused on um, a, kind of a volunteer um, or advocate audience. I, I know you folks are going to be engaging on a little bit different of a level. Um, you're going to be actually offering some services um, to uh, hopefully to the state legislature and 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 become a resource for them. Um, this is more on, you know, if we have, when I was at the Heart Association, we had one of our, our advocacy board members go up and meet with their individual legislator on, um, you know, uh, PE activity in schools. Um, it was one of, a, it was a big policy for, uh, for the American Heart Association. Um, th this is really focused on that audience. So, um, but I've changed some things up here. So reach out to us, reach out to Crystal and I, if, if you're engaging with lawmakers, um, you know, I, I think more, more than anything else, we really want to be a resource for folks. Um, again, we, we've, we've spent our careers getting to know these folks and getting to know the process um, and, and can usually be really helpful in, in that regard. Um, a couple other things to note, legislators are, are generals. If you haven't, if you haven't caught on already, they have a lot of different things going on up at the state capitol. So typically they're not going to be really, really in, in the weeds detail oriented on, on individual policies. There are some exceptions, that, but for the most part, they, they really are them and their staffs are generalists. Um, you'll, you'll traditionally be the expert in the me meeting. Now that's not to say that the, that, that you can necessarily patronize somebody or talk down to them, but it, but it just it just remarks on the fact that you know you're going to go in there with with a certain expertise and and to relay that expertise um, is, is really important. Um, important to to know who you're meeting with before you do. Um, and again, that's something that we can help with. Um, uh, another note on staff. Again, I'm, I'm biased here, but but staff sometimes in individual offices. They have a, a ton of a ton of ability, a ton of their own autonomy um, to to do things, and and a lot of uh, there's a lot of great staff up in that building, and so meeting with a staff member or talking to a staff member is by no means a, a blow off of any type. Um, it's it's just as important. Um, contact information is always always useful. Um, follow up um, that might be needed, and and always send a thank you. Um, some do's and don'ts, you know, be on time, turn off your phone. Obviously, that's not the case if we're doing virtual meetings. Um, uh, stay on message and topic, you know, if, if you're there to talk about one individual thing, just stay on that one individual thing. Uh, be polite, be, thank, thank folks, don't lose track of time. Again, uh, to reemphasize, don't disregard a meeting with staff. Um, you know, there, there's just some, some important steps. And again, our office can, can, be, helpful, uh, can be helpful in this regard, so. Um, and then the last couple things that I wanted to go through were just uh, resources for lawmakers and resources for you. So these are all, uh, or at least most of these are legislative service agencies. So I mentioned uh, the Legislative Reference Bureau before. Um, there's also a legislative council, which are kind of act as the uh, legislature's uh, attorneys. There's the fiscal bureau, uh, which really focuses in on the budget writing aspect of, of state government. Um, and, uh, and, and it plays a pivotal, pivotal role in, uh, in the budget process every single year. But there are a couple of external ones on here, like um, the NCSL, which is the National, um, National Council of State Legislators, um, is a great, uh, great resource for, for lawmakers. Um, and then I on lobbying, I, I put this on here, and it's not, not technically a, a, a group, but I, I'm talking about lobbyists across the state. Um, technically, Crystal and I are, are lobbyists. We're registered lobbyists, even though we're, we're more legislative liaisons or, or state, you know, state employee liaisons than we, than we are lobbyists. But when I was at the Heart Association, again, I was a registered lobbyist. Um, sometimes that word carries a, a negative connotation, but I think for lawmakers who really know how to utilize it, lobbyists, they're incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, they're there, um, you know, usually representing a client or multiple clients, um, but they're there to kind of, you know, fill those gaps in between expertise and in between the, the, the lawmaker who might be a generalist and, and their own individuals and their organizations who might be the experts. They're there to make sure that information is relayed, uh, make sure that, that, that they're kind of whittling stuff down into the most digestible form um, and, and, and really focused on that relationship aspect and, and ensuring that, uh, that things run smoothly. Um, and then 
again, last but not least, resources for, for each and every one of you. Um, the blue book is something that I mentioned before. Um, I, I don't expect anyone to go out there and read through the, the, the blue book page by page, um, but but it's an interesting, you know, there's there's been one done every year for, I don't know, the, the hundreds of years or something. But, um, it's it's an interesting resource and really gets into the details of like that that really core functions and, and some of the procedural stuff in individual bodies. It's also a good snapshot in time of history um, and individual committees and, and representatives and senators. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really interesting resource. And now they're all online too. You can, you can access them online pretty easily. And, the, and, and they usually do a great job of producing them too, so they look great. But probably the single biggest resource is the state legislative website. I know um, Sarah wanted me to touch on how to track things. Um, and they actually have a bill tracking service through the state legislature's website. You can find a bill, you can create a little login, um, and then get email updates whenever there's a, a movement in the process that, that is probably far and away the best way to, to track individual legislation um, and, to, uh, and to really focus in on, on committee work and, and other things happening. And then uh, last but not least us, uh, Crystal and I um, would love to be a resource. You know, uh, again, this is something that we um, can speak at, at length about, uh, which is obvious at this, at this point. Um, and, and so, you know, we're happy to, uh, to be a resource for each and every one of you and, and feel free to reach out with, uh, with any questions or, or, or anything else you want to talk about as it, as it relates to state government and the state legislature. Um, and so finally, Sarah, we, we get to the portion where I, I will stop talking for 52 straight minutes um, and <laughs> open it up for some questions. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Appreciate the round of applause. I'm just glad you're still awake. That's what that's what I'm happy about. So, yeah. So if you um, yeah, if you have a question, feel free to post it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask Ben. Or we have prepared questions too, so we have we have lots of question content. Uh, yeah. So Amanda asked in the chat, she was wondering at what point do uh, legislatures usually reach out to experts for advice? Ben, is that during the drafting process? Uh, could it be multiple stages kind of from your experience when do those offices reach out to experts and the process yeah and and i'm happy that this this is the type of question that came up in the q a because it's kind of hard to illustrate in any given slide or talk about it's it's really all the time and it, it it sometimes depends on the individual legislator. There are some that do their work entirely on the front end. So the, the, this whole election season, as I talked about, there are folks who are drafting up policies and focused in on policies. They could be reaching out to, to, to experts right now um, and, and making sure a policy is, is, is uh, you know, kind of reviewed and, and run through with a fine tooth comb um, prior to introduction. Um, that's the way that I, when I was in the, uh, the state capitol and was working on policy, that's the way we always tried to do it in my office. Um, but there are some that really just want to get something out there and then have folks react to it. So they'll, they'll have the, the experts come in um, during, you know, hopefully not during the committee process. That's always kind of a weird, uh, that's just always kind of a weird venue for, for first time feedback being given because it's so public. Um, usually you want to have meetings um, individual from that more, more private um, especially if you have some maybe constructive criticism for an individual policy, but really it, it's it's dependent on the legislator and and it's at any given time throughout that throughout this whole how a bill becomes a law process. So, yeah, uh, looks like we have another question from uh, Chris, uh, which is sort of how are staff organized in offices? So is there like sort of a hierarchy of staff, or are they all kind of equal? Sure, <laughs> this is another one again dependent on the legislator. <laughs> typically, typically, so I, I went back to the office structure slide here just to just to kind of show this a little bit more. So you look at Senator Coles and, and typically the Senate, it's a little bit easier to distinguish roles and responsibilities because you have larger staff. So there's typically a chief of staff who is the head of the office and they're they're dealing with kind of the office operation stuff and and typically the top most experienced person in that office. If you look on Senator Coles, for instance, don't take these staff lists as um, as anything more than just kind of, are they even alphabetical order? Oh, they are alphabetical order. Okay, so so at least they're that. Sometimes they're just an arbitrary order. Um, but Jason, uh, Jason Munyaini, uh, he is Senator Cole's chief of staff right now. Um, uh, the other three staff in the office are all focused on different things, but Jason's actually the chief of staff just because he's listed last doesn't mean anything. So a senator will typically have a chief of staff, but then dependent on the senator, their roles and responsibilities could vary. Some folks 
uh, break it up very horizontally. So you'll have a chief of staff, you'll have a communications director, you'll have a policy director, and you'll have someone focused on constituent services, and they all stay in those individual buckets um, and focus on those roles. I was fortunate enough in the in the Senate office that I worked for the longest, we were more vertically um, uh, assigned. So I was assigned different policy areas, I actually had, you know, transportation and, uh, you know, uh, I don't even know what else it's been so long. No, like natural resources and healthcare and things like that. And so in that individual policy area, I handled policy development. I handled constituent services work. I handled some of the communications work and my colleagues, they each had their individual forces as well. So it really depends on the legislator. Um, yeah, so Sarah also had a good question, which is kind of in the calendar that you talked about, what are kind of the best times for engagement? So um you know would you recommend maybe like avoiding trying to engage during the like budget process early in year one or are there kind of times that are really optimal for um sort of that engagement or other kind of best practice tips like that yeah yeah sure um and so the, as i as i mentioned the calendar is kind of a mess uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's 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 all over the place at times really uh, when when the budget is happening as you said chris as you alluded to it uh, when the budget is happening really that's what's every that's every, what people are focused on you know the, the, they don't they don't necessarily want to talk proactively about um a policy that they might introduce a year later um, when the state budget is, is literally sitting on their desk and they're reviewing it. And it, even members not on joint finance, the budget is a very important, uh, very important thing that takes up a lot of time. So, so really that budget time, time period um, is really the, the, the biggest one to avoid. Now there are, there are you know, one-offs of that. There are, the, there are definitely exceptions to that rule. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can go in and talk to a member if they really want to, you know, but that's, that's more on them. I, I wouldn't necessarily do, do a lot of forceful engagement um, during during the budget process the other the other time periods are during those recess time periods you know it's really time for legislators a lot of them take vacations you know spend time with family that they don't otherwise get to visit and then the other one that's that's got a little bit more nuance is the election season you know if a legislator doesn't really have an election to worry about that's a great time to engage you know they don't they don't have you know they're probably in their districts doing some stuff they're probably working on some stuff in their office but they don't necessarily have a, a ton going on and that can be really that proactive time to engage with legislators but you know i think i think it for all these questions this is something definitely come to our office and talk to us about and and get our get our feedback because it can vary from legislator to legislator um, and Chris, if you if you can humor me, one thing that I forgot to to mention when um, we're talking about engaging with lawmakers, um, and I didn't put this on here for a reason, um, but it's just something worth remembering. Um, I, I remember when I was at the Heart Association, my colleague always used the term. There's a difference in being persistent and being a pest. Um, what you'll run into a lot of times with lawmakers, since they are again, they're generalists, they're very very busy, they've got a ton of stuff going on, even their staff have a ton of things going on you can run into the fact and i think we got into this conversation during uh during our meeting with the with the folks at the la follette school you can run into instances where you will reach out to folks proactively to to offer them something or to to talk proactively about a policy and they're very interested and they get back to you right away and they want to do things and then two months will go by and then you won't hear from them i mean it, it just happens things things fall off fall off their plate and so again i use that phrase being persistent without being a pest you know, certainly remember to, to follow up and certainly remember to, to maybe flag things or, or shove things to the top of an inbox from time to time. But you also never want to cross that line into, into, into pestering an elected official or an office. So just something worth noting that I, that I forgot to bring up while we were on that slide. Yeah, that's a great point. So we have um, two more questions that will kind of condense and hopefully we can get some information. One is about um, the demographics of the state legislature. Is there like a good place you can go or would you recommend to like find that information or is it just kind of searching on the legislate legislative like website to determine demographic makeup of the chambers? Yeah, when you, so demographic, you're talking about Republican versus Democratic breakdown, that, that, that sort of stuff? Uh, the question is just uh, the demographics of legislators. So perhaps <clears throat> beyond uh, partisan identity, oh I God. think is what April is getting at. April, okay. you can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Um, I was more thinking of like, what, what do people do for jobs? Sure. What, what's their like familial background? Do they own property? How long have they lived in Wisconsin? Are they like Wisconsin natives? Just, just a little curious about that. Like, do you have to be 
like from Wisconsin to, to run for, I know that sounds really dumb, but like. No, no, it's a great, no, no. It's a, I'm interested at some point. You're so. asking if I can ever run for state office because I'm from Illinois. Um, yes, I can. Oh <laughs> no, I don't know about. So I would never get elected because I'm a Bears fan, but uh, I oh, can't no. really want to. I can I can try fruitlessly um, to get to get elected here. Um, no, you you just have to be a, a Wisconsin rep. Actually, there are multiple members, April, of the state legislature. Excuse me, right now are are from other states. Joel Kitchens, for instance, um, represents Door County, that very very north northeast corner of the state, the peninsula out there. He is not from Wisconsin. He actually got his vet. vet um, and he got his veterinary degree from Ohio State. I know it's terrible. It's horrible. And him and I get in arguments about football every single year. Um, but he he's not from Wisconsin, but he represents a Wisconsin Assembly District. So, um, Chris, or a, a, April, excuse me, I guess the, the best place to, to look for that stuff really is the legislative website. When you dig in there, you can find biographical information on each legislator. The Blue Book is another place where they'll, where they'll give, you know, brief bios on everybody. Um, and then one of the other places, um, you know, I, I don't want to service too much of a ballotpedia. Um, they do a pretty decent job of, of, you know, breaking down individual districts and giving some biographical information. But there's, there's a bunch of different places where you can find that. And, and again, another one, I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but reach out to Crystal and I. We're, we're happy to, to help. Um, we typically have brief bios done up for every single member of the legislature um, at the beginning of, uh, of, a, of a biennium. So. Okay. And then I think um, maybe if you just want to touch on this uh, quickly and then we'll uh, wrap up. But Maya had a question about, uh, you, you sort of mentioned how um, state agencies will weigh in during the committee process. Uh, and so Maya was curious just sort of how much the sort of that research being done by state agencies affects sort of the final outcome of the bill and whether or not this research is done by outside experts or experts in-house at those state agencies. So since you're a little familiar, I guess, with that, if you, you might want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful question as well. And I, I should not have expected anything but great questions from this group, um, considering our, our engagement so far. It, it, and this is another one, unfortunately, that I can't give like a straight yes or no answer to or a straight one line answer. You know, it, it can, but it also can't, you know, and, and, and Chris, as you mentioned, you know, my, my former role in a state agency, I like to think that our, that our, that our opinions and our and our, our own research and our own um, thoughts and, and uh, feedback on a bill had carried the most weight of anybody. And, uh, and sometimes we would, uh, you know, I, we would get thrown out of offices because we were idiots. No, I'm, I'm, that's, that's, a, that's hyperbole. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that, that never happened, but sometimes our, our feedback just wasn't taken into account because uh, whether or not the legislator had their own thoughts about, uh, about something, or maybe we disagreed with a specific stakeholder or interest group, um, you know, all, all depends. Um, and, and, and I guess it's ultimately for the legislator, the, the individual author, and then the legislature as a, as an entire body and, um, uh, to, to determine what, what they want to pursue in, in terms of, in terms of bill language. Um, and so come in, we would try to, as often as we could meet proactively on, on individual bills affecting natural resources. Sometimes we would leave with a, a different policy altogether or an amendment um, that, that really uh, took into consideration all of our feedback. Sometimes we would leave with nothing and uh, we had to live with that. So um, it, it, it can really depend. But I think, uh, again, I, I think it's a, a missed opportunity if you don't at least try. And that was, that was what my goal always was at the DNR um, was to, to engage and, and to engage as much as possible. I, I wanted to be a trusted by members. You know, everything's got a little bit, this is, this is politics, you know, this is state government. Everything's got a little bit of a partisan tilt to it. Um, fortunately, I, I, I actually have experience on both sides of the aisle during, during my uh, time with the, with the state legislature. Um, and, and so I've got a little bit of, a little bit of uh, bipartisan experience, but, but, you know, when you're walking in representing a state agency in the, in the Evers administration, and you're talking to a Republican lawmaker, you know, they, they, you know, they might not, they might not uh, take everything that you have to say with, uh, with, with the most amount of seriousness. Um, but I think, again, my goal was always to be trusted um, and to, to build relationships and to get to a place where hopefully, you know, people thought we were coming in and offering unbiased, um, completely nonpartisan uh, feedback on bills. And I think that's always the goal, whether we're here in this role, whether you folks are gonna be doing that with the, the resources that you wanna be providing. I think that's always the goal. You never, you never wanna be viewed in, in one light or another. I think, I think when it comes to policy development and um, feedback on specific policies, I think it's, it's always 
we're doing this with 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 the best research that we can and and uh, hopefully uh, you know conveying a level of trust so i waxed on there for a little while i apologize <laughs> no that's well, okay. i guess maybe yeah. Are we, yeah go ahead chris yeah i was gonna say i think we can wrap up but maybe one thing that then if you want to end on maybe some people i think probably have a concern especially with graduate students that were not from wisconsin and so um you know should people be concerned about only reaching out to their state rep or a state senator that represents them and you here in Madison or, or should we sort of feel empowered to reach out to, you know, should we be scared about engaging with legislators across the state or, or sort of limited kind of your take home message of people that are interested in, in engaging, we can kind of wrap up with that. Sure. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone should, should necessarily be scared. I mean, the worst that's going to happen um, is they're going to say, well, uh, you know, I'll direct you to your your representative. But again, in this specific case, with with what we're working on, you know, this 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 resource um, and and service to the state legislature, you know, I, I don't think it I don't think it has to be just confined to to district parameters. If you're reaching out as as a as a citizen, as an individual member of of Wisconsin society on something completely unrelated to your work with CASP. I would certainly recommend reaching out to just your state legislator at least to start, because um, that's that's where you're going to get the most traction. And that's that's where you know that's where you live. That's that's the person that you're a constituent um, to. Um, but if if you're reaching out on on other things, and again, our office can help with this. Um, you know, it it it's can it can be worthwhile to focus in if it's a natural resources related policy. It can be really helpful to reach out to someone like Rob Coles, not to mention Senator Coles again, but he's, you know, he's the natural resources guy in the state Senate. That's really his focus. And so if, if you're reaching out on, on that topic, it's helpful to reach out to him. If it's transportation, Senator Petrowski is your guy, you know, just because he represents Wausau doesn't mean that he doesn't want to hear from someone who is an expert on transportation related policy who lives in I don't know, Platteville, you know, um, just because it's all the way across the state from his district. So um, it really depends. But again, if it's if it's your own individual advocacy or or, um, or, or uh, questions or, or concerns that you have, um, then you definitely want to start with your own lawmaker. Great. Thank you, um, Ben, for answering all of our questions and for, for providing this information you've given us a, a wealth of things to think about and a great overview um, of the legislature and how, how we might engage. So we have appreciated working with you this fall and look forward to continuing to tap your expertise and, and collaborate on different um, topics. So um, Ben's listed their contact information there if you wanna get in touch. Um, and you, know, you can always reach out to us within CASP as well. Um, if you want more information on CASP, you can go to our website, casp.wist.edu. Um, I wish we could all give you a round of applause, but you'll <laughs> have to just take the, the virtual applause um, from us today. But as long as everyone's still, as long as everyone's still awake, that's, that's, that's good enough by me, Sarah. I really do appreciate the time. And, and again, always happy to help and, and here to be a resource. So reach out at any time. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben.